we find ourselves at a you know crucial juncture in the world of uh, talent acquisition. Um, the events of the past uh, few years have transformed the global landscape uh, in ways we could never have predicted. Um, but we are uh, here to explore how this landscape will continue to evolve um, in the next year and you know years ahead. Um, I'm Avinash, I'm one of the co-founders of Global Talent Exchange. Um, I'm super excited uh, to be hosting this uh, distinguished uh, panel uh, here. Um, um, we are an exclusive uh, global recruitment platform uh, mobilizing emerging tech talent um, or SMEs, uh, you know, from global tech hubs. Um, so you heard of uh, brain drain, brain gain. Um, so we're working on this uh, global brain, tapping into, you know, I mean, global brain circulation um, and ensuring the talent is evenly distributed across developed and developing nations. Um, the global situation, um, as we all know, um, has been marked, uh, you know, by uncertain uncertainty, adversity, change, and of course, the pandemic has reshaped the way we work, introducing remote employment, the digital transformation at an unprecedented pace, um, economic challenges, uh, shifting workforce dynamics, and uh, you know, geopolitical shifts have you know added layers to. The complexity, you know, of the talent acquisition, you know, process. Um, of course, we gathered here um, to deep uh, dive into, you know, some of these things. Uh, most of you bring a wealth of experience, uh, a lot of insight, and uh, innovative strategies to address um, the talent talent challenges that lie ahead of us. Um, so, in the face of adversities, uh, leaders across industries have displayed remarkable resilience and adaptability. Um, They've had to rethink how to attract, retain, and develop talent uh, in a rapidly uh, changing world. Uh, with an eye for the future, um, you are you all are uh, you know crafting uh, strategies that will shape uh, your organization's success and empower them to you know compete on a global scale. Um, this panel discussion um, we aim to dissect the you know trend strategies and the shifting dynamics the, that will determine the talent landscape. Uh, in the years to come. Um, we will dwell into the role that technology, diversity and inclusion, remote work and sustainability are playing in uh, shaping the future of talent acquisition. So um, without uh, further ado, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll quickly do round of introductions. Um, you know, before that, um, you know, I mean, <clears throat> Uh, I just want to kind of set the house rules. Uh, this is a closed room discussion, so you can really be vocal about what you say here. It will be attributed to you as an individual in, in case there's a challenge, uh, you know, quoting your company's name. Um, if you have a point, uh, please raise your hand and we'll, uh, you know, come to you. Uh, let's keep it crisp uh, so that we can optimize uh, on the time. Um, so great. So let's kind of uh, begin with a round of introduction. I'll go as per the order that I can see on the screen. Uh, we'll start with Jaljit. Uh, over to you, uh, Jaljit. If you can state your name, uh, what you do, and also an opening uh, statement uh, in terms of uh, how has been the last year for you and what are some of the you know global uh, trends that you are seeing uh, from a talent acquisition standpoint, uh, Jaljit, from your perspective. Yeah, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, this is Jeljit. Uh, I work with Nissan uh, in their uh, global capability center uh, in Trivandrum. So, um, and uh, uh, have been in HR for yeah more than twenty five years now, and uh, uh, worked with FMCG and uh, different sectors, telecom, IT, etc., and uh, with Nissan for the last five years now with. Nissan. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, um, off late, I have not been into or, uh, some of these uh, uh, leadership discussions, though I did one a couple of weeks back, which just happened. And then right. uh, uh, this is the second one. So I'm yeah, glad to be here. Uh, for me, I think uh, this last year has been good in terms of the <clears throat> overall uh, I would say stabilization of the, in terms of the market situation compared to the FI22, which was a lot more buoyant, 
a lot more uh, activity hiring happening people even uh, candidates out looking out and all that so uh, we did not lose a lot of people in fy22 but then it was still a little bit uh, on the higher side i would say but this year i mean till now what i have seen is that uh, i mean it's uh, the market is slowed down i would say and uh, not much of um uh, activity uh, there is a little bit of caution overall in the candidates everywhere i think uh, uh, nobody is really switching just for the sake of it unless there is a real reason to switch so there is a lot of that caution that is coming and uh, a little a little bit of uncertainty with all that recessionary talk going on and you know how the global markets are you know moving and uh, there is and and from the client side as you saw in it especially the client side and spends drop and you will always see that the sentiment goes down and then that is pretty much there uh, so we're not losing a lot of people also so which means we have our attrition now it's like 7% uh, compared to like 20% year on year i mean if i compare so the same time um, so there is a lot of uh, things have kind of uh, slow down stabilized uh, is this year and uh, uh, but we have also not been able to hire a lot of people as i mentioned because of that uh, air of caution you know a lot of people are not switching and we have been so hiring has been difficult in the sense compared to previous year where people are out there uh, now not many people out there looking out so that makes it a lot more difficult to hire uh, the right people that we need uh, we are in the we are in the digital space so Uh, the kind of people we need are not in uh, in in large supply so that's what it is but yeah that i leave it there now because i know there's a lot to be shared thank you thanks so uh, welcome um, augustus uh, over to you thank you avinash and uh, morning everybody and uh, coming on the back of diwali holidays so i'm a bit rusted so <laughs> uh coming to uh, an introduction uh call me augie and um, i have been with ibm and ibm chose to spin off a large infrastructure business uh with about um, 90000 employees globally and 30000 in india um and in the infrastructure management space and the company is called kindrel so we are a separate entity trading on the new york stock exchange i lead the uh, hr for the apma region and um, what are we talking about in the year past i'm surprised that we're already talking about 2023 in the past okay but uh, nevertheless um, it's been a good year for us okay from a business standpoint now what does that convert into uh, from a talent acquisition standpoint is that yes the war for talent continued to hot up in the in the marketplace that we go and fish in um so uh, we have had our challenges but you know we are an organization which is fairly new with a legacy of 112 years with ibm and the heart of a startup okay so um, in a sense we have been able to attract those employees because um, we are a completely flexible working organization all right and as against the market chance to get everybody back to office uh i don't think we are talking that but we are saying hey what are your preferences and how can we make you productive in the flexible working environment that we have okay so so that has been a draw so maybe maybe we talk about it more when we are uh, in the uh, employer branding aspect okay but um, in terms of uh, the overall market see we are in the infrastructure management space which means that we uh, are hiring right across the spectrum okay um, and uh, now i i did hear jaljit also speaking with a low attrition at 7% now i i would say that you know attrition is sector specific and it is also region specific so if you take trivandrum it could have a lower attrition but if you take uh, pune or a bengaluru there is going to be a different uh attrition level so i i would rather say that uh, you know as against you know painting the whole thing at one level of attrition we do have similar um, similar characteristics like jaljit said we have a different level of attrition in tamil nadu different in hyderabad and uh, of course 
uh, Bengaluru and Gurgaon are about the same levels. Okay. Now, what are the challenges we face? Okay. It continues to be on women diversity. Okay. Now, um, not to even mention this, but still, post pandemic, we did have a lot of women fall off the grid. All right. And now getting them back into work and, you know, bridging the skill gap for them has been a challenge. So while talking about skills, we are constantly challenged by the skills that we need and what is available. Okay. Now, today, let's say we have about 5,000 AWS engineers, certified engineers, but that's not enough. The demand into India, in spite of the geopolitical shifts that you are seeing, continues to be high. So to me, talent is the skill gap. Thank you. Welcome, Rustas. Thank you. Okay. Manu. Manu Sharma, over to you. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, my name is Manu Sharma. I have been working with Hero Electric for the past uh, 17 years. Before that, I worked with uh, Hero Cycles. So Hero has been the name of the game for me uh, for the past 22 years. So, uh, uh, so we are uh, in automobile sector and we are trying to disrupt the market for the past 17 years. We have managed to uh, shake the market a bit. We have managed to take away uh, a little. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Oh, I think it is. Hi, hi, Venkat. Hi, hi. Sorry. Sorry. So, uh, primarily, we have been trying to uh, take this well-established market of two-wheelers and uh, take a share out of it. And that has been a challenge. Uh, our market has uh, evolved. Uh, for longest period of time, we were at 1%, less than 1% of uh, the total two-wheeler shares. Now, the market has evolved to 5%, thanks to all the people who are putting in money who's, uh, who have uh, understood the importance of electric mobility in two-wheeler segment. And thanks to the uh, government incentives which have been reduced now uh, uh, so there will be adverse effect because that has been the yo-yo effect on the electric mobility for the past uh, n you know n number of years when if you go back to the history you realize that every time there's an incentive the industry grows as soon as the incentive stops the industry wipes out so currently there are 350 players in electric two wheelers so uh, as soon as this market uh, actually saturates, uh, which is not going to happen in the next five, six years, we will have, uh, uh, you know, five to six players remaining. So there'll be a bloodbath. There'll be a lot of manpower. Uh, there is a requirement of tremendous amount of manpower. And uh, unfortunately, India has not learned how to make electric mobility. So most of us were available, were depending on the the mature market of electric mobility, which is China, which has been doing this uh, business of electric mobility for the past 30 to 40 years. So they are that many years ahead of us. Europe has not matured to that level. They are just making bicycles. America is just doing those pedelec scooters, basically. Uh, India is the only hope for electric mobility. So that's where the government is also focusing. Now, uh, as far as talent is concerned, uh, we don't know how to produce. We have, don't know how to make vehicles right now. We have been woken up with a jolt that you have to start making electric scooters uh, like yesterday. So but from the technology part, we are very behind. We last year tried to find lithium in India. Uh, so we found some lithium and we don't know how good that is, whether it's usable or not. Uh, we don't know how to make batteries yet. We just know how to pack the batteries. So we import cells from China and pack it. And then we put a sticker of Make in India on it. So that's another story. So basically, this is how things have been. And uh, there's a lot. All the components uh, in comparison to a regular scooter which has about 2,200 components, moving parts. Uh, electric mobility only has 22 to 30. So 
it is easier to make but the difference in the in in in, in, in a regular scooter and electric scooter is uh, of the feel of it how it is this is the chance to make the scooters better that it is not just fuel based uh, fuel is not the only difference but the softer side of the vehicle uh, what we have been the uh, you know iot is something which is going to be very strong in electric mobility so these are some of the open areas and problem that i have been facing is that i sit in gurgaon so we opened our r&d center about 3 years back and i hired about uh, 100 150 engineers uh, who uh, were coming who came from uh, down south and it was very difficult for them and it was a learning for me as well how should i make sure that they feel at home uh, and that process had to be really cleared somebody would ring the bell is that a time something no um that's somebody kind of logged in uh, i mean okay. so that's uh, that's another challenge uh, which we are facing i would love to hear from you how to handle this situation i especially from uh, the american companies because they have been managing the engineers offshore as well and how do we actually you know make them feel comfortable so that is something which i which we really need to learn from indian companies perspective so thank you i look forward to learning a lot from you guys welcome manu um kamal hey morning everyone uh, good to see you all <laughs> uh, so yeah i am kamal i am uh, working for about 20 plus years in the uh, hr space been performing different roles in hr uh, right now i am leading the talent uh, uh, for uh, a company called techion techion is a 7 year old company uh, predominantly started in the americas by the ex ceo of tesla so the intent of starting this company was to have a software product developed for the automotive industry uh, because there were a lot of companies who were doing this but automotive industry was not getting a one stop solution so uh, what techion did is it automated all uh, you know manual processes and gave a one stop solution starting from the customer who's you know walking into the uh, showroom to book a car till he disposes the car he or she disposes the car in that life cycle how a dealer manages uh, things um, you know at their end uh, the payroll the stocks etc how a manufacturer or the oem gets an update so i i see people from ashok leyland and hero you know they'll understand uh, the context that i'm talking about a little more in depth so uh, this gives complete transparency to the customer uh to the manufacturer because customer relates to a brand than a dealership right so i would relate to uh, a mercedes than relating to a tvs sundaram who's a dealer right so if the dealer screws up the brand goes down so uh, there is a win win situation for the brand for the customer and also a big win for the dealer because uh, they make uh, a lot of things more efficient Uh, in the process so in this space during the pandemic we did a lot of things and it worked really well for us because uh, techion uh, gave them a product uh, which helped people uh, get their car serviced owned etc without a physical touch so which was never heard of in the automobile industry so that is when you know suddenly techion saw so much of growth because the product was so robust and people liked it so much it brought in a lot of efficiencies reduced a lot of cost and you don't need to manage like 10 different softwares you know want to manage the payroll want to manage tax want to manage stocks want to manage the end customer and give them an app so uh, this product gave them an end to end solution so the talent that we've been looking at is predominantly in india uh, software developers uh, because we are a software development center uh, 80% of our global strength is in india uh, we are about a 3000 company and two 1000 2400 approximately in india between chennai and bangalore so we see a lot of talent flowing between these two cities uh, uh up north we have hired a lot of people from there but the movement has become a little bit of a problem despite hybrid work i see after the hybrid uh, you know after the remote work kind of settled down now when we are moving to a little on the hybrid side we see people slowly you know looking at opportunities in their own cities because there are 
uh, opportunities that we are getting. Uh, attrition is not that bad um, when compared to what we have seen in the past as a software industry or Techion as a company. Uh, we are seeing half of what we had seen earlier. So yes, people are taking a very cautious approach in making their job moves. Um, and they're also being very selective about the opportunities that they're getting uh, from the market. I don't see that there is uh, uh, a dearth for good talent, uh, but uh, you know what happens is people are hiring for skill. Uh, we are today not talking about uh, people coming from an amazing educational background, et cetera, et cetera. But I am always looking for hiring or Techion is always looking for hiring people who could come and do the job, right? How skilled are they to do the job? So that's exactly what is happening. So yeah, that's a quick um, intro about myself and the company that I work for. And I look forward to insights from all of you in this discussion. Thank you. Welcome, welcome Kamal. Um, uh, Venkat, over to you next. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, yeah. Uh, good morning, Avinash. And good morning, all my uh, you know, colleagues from uh, different companies. Uh, I'm happy and uh, privileged to be part of this uh, group. And as, as I go along, I also learn from all of you and get insight from different industry. I'm Venkat. Uh, I've got 26 years of experience. Uh, I've been with Ashok Leland for the last two years. I'm heading HR for their uh, technical center. This is a global technical center based out of uh, Chennai. And I work with uh, uh, different uh, companies, mostly with uh, Automajor and also with uh, Auto Component. And had a brief stint with uh, Grassum Industries uh, also on stint with Stride Sarko Lab uh, at Bangalore and Pharma and all through with auto components and uh, OEMs. And I have a long stint with Tafe. Again, it's a tractor manufacturing company. That's about uh, 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 me. Uh, how did the past go? Uh, past went exceptional for me. If I say exceptional for me, I should say that uh, Ashok Leland or any CV industry, it's at an inflection point. Uh, what we were in 1940s and 50s in terms of bringing in uh, different variants of diesel engine and uh, bringing in different commercial vehicle, we are at this point of time now because there's going to be number of alternate energy which is going to come up starting from hydrogen ice to hydrogen fuel cells and electric vehicle, name whatever it is, CNG to methanol to, you know, every now and then once in three months you'll uh, listen from Nathan Gadkari saying that, you know, he wants methanol to be run and all you know, said from the beginning, we just start working on methanol. So we need to have 10 to 15, uh, you know, alternate energy in place. Uh, at least have a proof of concept. We don't know. This is a messy decade for us. We don't know how the market is going to disrupt. And whenever the market is going to disrupt, we are going to have a product ready. Otherwise, we are going to lose our uh, first mover advantage in the market. Uh, no more OEM is a OEM. Anybody can become an OEM. That's the platform which has opened up uh, for everyone. You will find Reliance in automobile. You will find Adanis in your automobile. What do they do? They'll be part of one component in the entire value chain and they'll be calling themselves also OEM or an auto major going forward because it's a level playing field at this point of time. You know, anybody can start electric, anybody can start a hydrogen fuel cell and it's just, you know, import 70, 80% of component and you have a vehicle on your own. So think about Ashok Leland's and Tata's at this point of time. All along, we have been leaders and all along, we have been dominating the market. It's it's completely opened up for everyone and level playing field. So in that context, coming to my talent acquisition and, and HR per se, you have a lot of challenges. You, know? you need to build up capability. If I say building up capability, you need to uh, think about the existing uh, skill set, what is available in the company because you can't hire for all the 15 technologies across. You need to reskill your people. You need to, you know, make them capable wherever it is possible because we are a mechanical engineering company. So going forward from a mechanical to a mechatronics or electrical engineering company, how far we can reskill these people. Some of the jobs in some family of jobs can be reskilled, and we are looking at reskilling in a bigger way. Second, uh, last year it was it was uh, more importantly creating the talent pipeline leadership pipeline from in all the advanced engineering and i've had around 150 people last year and these are all niche skills uh, i don't want to go into details these are all niche skills uh, where 
you need people working in electric, you need people working in hydrogen fuel cell, you need people working in hydrogen ice, name what. So I've created a platform and a separate advanced engineering group per se, around 115, 200 people are put in place and retaining them going forward is a challenge and uh, making their role more, uh, you know, uh, important, more critical is also going uh, forward as a challenge. A lot of things, uh, some of my colleagues have touched in terms of retention. The only challenge for me is to, uh, how do I make this role more uh, exciting for them, exciting for the organization? And that will be the major challenge. And in terms of building a platform in the organization, I've already done that. So this brief about Ashok Lil in the last one year. And we are buoyant. Market last year was uh, growing exceptionally 15 20%. This year also it will go. And next year also we are, we are buoyant about it. Fantastic. Uh, Venkat, awesome. Welcome, uh, Venkat. Harsha? Thanks, Vinash. Good uh, morning, everyone. My name is Harsha Kumar Maravanahali, and uh, I am with uh, Brilio since a month. Uh, I'm fairly new to Brilio, but otherwise I come with about 15 plus years of industry experience. I've been in technology hiring all along my career. My earliest stint was with a retail GCC called Fellabella, Latin American, Latin American GCC. So uh, coming to uh, uh, last year, right, or this year, like I, like somebody rightly said, we are already talking of 2023 as though it is gone by, but it, we're still in the flag end of 2023, right? Uh, so it is, it, my experience is a mix of uh, uh, two extremes, right? Uh, one, uh, on, on the one end, we've been fighting for top talent. I would only say top talent because uh, whether it was at Fellabella or here at Brilio, what we are still trying to uh, find uh, is top talent, not the run of the mill talent. What is top talent, right? Today, historically, if you see organizations, they're structured in the shape of pyramid. There's a there is a uh, there is a leader which is a business leader or a technology leader or a product leader are all three in combination and then there is top talent which is highly nimble agile and can learn and unlearn technology at speed and then you have a people who will execute okay so by definition it doesn't mean that top talent is someone uh, who has a lot of years of experience who knows a skill uh, for quite a number of years and has been in that space for a while it is somebody who knows multiple technologies who's extremely nimble who could be one two three or four years experience person right so the war for talent has always been in this space mm -hmm. on one end but on the other end, most companies, especially uh, GCCs in India, especially retail for that matter, uh, has seen a churn in terms of, okay, so we have heavily invested in building capacity. Uh, I mean, considering 2021 and post-pandemic uh, behavior of customer, because there was a lot of spend and people were buying big ticket items and uh, we built most companies build capacity for that. But what do you do with that capacity if customer spend decreases, right? And sudden uh, change in uh, economic scenario globally, right? Spend, spend, spend patterns change. The cost of logistics increased. You could no longer push high ticket, big ticket items. You can, you could no longer push new features on your e-commerce product to the market. What does this mean? This basically means you have to reprioritize and cost optimization discussions, not just at the resource level, also from a technology spend level. So how do you still make sure that you retain your top talent, give them career path, and make sure that they're still motivated and they stay with you? And as HR and talent acquisition, you still make sure that there's a positive messaging in the market. This is one of the challenges that most year professionals have faced, right? Your company is laying off in certain segments, but still you're expected to hire in certain segments. So how do you still have a positive outlook and have a right messaging out? There's a challenge that we all have faced. So that's why I said it's a mix of both ends, right? One end, we are struggling to find talent. On the other end, we have to take tough calls, have as much rational as, uh, as possible behind letting go of people, right? This is one of the trends that I have seen. Another trend, because most service companies uh, will agree with me, uh, I don't call really as a service company. How we have positioned ourselves in the market is, we are digital transformation consultant for different industries, starting from original equipment manufacturing to healthcare, to life sciences, to banking and financial sector, to high tech. In all these areas, we consult for our customers, right? So most of the multinational companies are coming to India not for cost advantage anymore, okay? The talent density for technology talent in India is increasing by the day, right? And people are coming for that to India. And how do we still make sure that we hire efficiently, retain the talent, provide cutting-edge technology solutions to our customers is the challenge that we are trying to solve. 
So I think that's that's how 2023 has been so far. And our strategy for 2024 will be more or less in the same line. How do we attract and retain top talent? Awesome. Welcome, uh, Harsha. Uh, Kirit. Thanks, Avinash. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kirit. Uh, I lead talent acquisition for Razorpay and its uh, acquired entities. Uh, and, uh, you know, before Razorpay, it's, it's been around two and a half years with Razorpay right now. And uh, before this, I had a three year sprint with Uber and uh, 10 years with Adobe before that. That's where I started my career. Excited to be around in this group, uh, especially Venkat. Uh, lovely hearing you because my childhood dream was always to become a truck driver. Uh, I still follow, I'll be honest with you, I still follow the Canadian trucking and whatever, those huge trucks. Uh, and one truck that always fascinated with me was the Ashok Leland 709. Okay. Uh, which I think is now only supplied to the Indian Army. The size of the tire is my height, almost 5'8", 5'7", 9". Yeah. Uh, so, the These are the yeah. two brands we supply to our Indian Army. Yeah, so so pretty uh, a truck enthusiast with a literally a learner's license. So uh, yeah, so folks, I've always been in the tech industry all my life. Uh, and you know, some of the nuances I heard are really amazing and you know, good, great problems to solve. Um, so, you know, the last two and a half years for me at Razorpay specifically, uh, I joined them just after the first year of COVID. Um, and it was like a boon, right? Because all the new techs, like FinTech was still, it did kind of exist, but the EdTech, all these, you know, came in during, like they really got the, the limelight during the pandemic. And we had a lot of people. Uh, one great thing about this company and, you know, for me coming from two uh, American giants, uh, I did have butterflies in my stomach before joining an Indian company. Um, was that, you know, how the culture is going to be. But to my pleasant surprise with uh, two very young founders, the focus is always on people and uh, the culture, right? And that really, as Avinash calls us, the raise pay, the poster boys of Indian tech stories, uh, that kind of helped us retain this. Um, the last year, year and a half uh, for us have been, uh, you know, there's been diverse experiences for us while we as a company were uh, on a spree uh, with the right reasons and they're showing the right outcomes to acquire certain companies. So basically inorganic, um, we reach out to areas that we were not in, right? So we acquired a company called EasyTab, which we now call POS. So they basically are the point of sale devices. We acquired another three companies in India. There's one in uh, Malaysia. So we are kind of, you know, getting into new businesses uh, with the help of these acquired organizations and their expertise. Um, that kind of hindered a little bit of our recruiting because... Um, Hinder in terms of it, it restricted because we don't want to be like an overbloated company, but just making sure that we have the internal talent at the right place, right? So there's a lot of internal talent movement that's still happening because you've literally acquired 800 odd people in one year. Um, the other part was, you know, uh, this these movements, right? So we we actually are also actively looking at uh, spreading our wings in the APAC market, right? Because fintech in in some of the countries like malaysia indonesia doesn't exist to the to the level that india has in fact i would say across the world india india has some of the solid uh, the best infrastructure when it comes to fintech right um so those are you know some of the things that are keeping us busy exciting and anxious as well uh, because some of the things are done for the first time but these are good great process on. but from a world landscape I think people are still trying to get their fingers around or their arms around how GPT is going to impact their life and their jobs. Um, people are unfortunately losing their jobs. I started my career in 2008-9 when the Lehman Brothers thing happened. Um, and the same, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a nostalgic feeling right now. Uh, but people are still thinking that, you know, is, is this going to continue for long? So there is no um, clarity about, you know, how how we how 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 employment is going to go how the market's going to be of course because of the macroeconomic situation geopolitical situations in the world but i feel um, india from where it's poised uh, has a great chance to move forward um, and and this is the you know i mean from from at least a company like razorpay and, and certain others right this is the time where you know we could kind of go global uh, i'm not saying you know i'll go and you know launch something like a stripe in the us but uh, there are other smaller, you know, probably countries or regions where uh, there is a dire need of digitization. I'm talking from a money movement matter, um, and I'm sure there are there are other aspects as well where um, or other industries where we can actually go and do this. So I see a great opportunity for most of the businesses, at least for what I do and what we do is something small. There is there's more from an infrastructure, mobility, etc. 
ours is easy to implement to be honest um but uh, i think uh, the trend is going to continue that you know the the movement the growth is going to be slow uh from a business point of view but it would be maybe you know the milestones going to be shorter smaller uh, it's the 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 yards going to be longer uh from a talent perspective folks uh, attrition at razor pay um, has been a little on the higher side in a, even in a slow year um so on one side we are losing talent but we losing great talent as well unfortunately um so as as all of us been saying that people are actually hiring top talent which is correct um hiring has been limited people would not move for the next 6 months to 9 months because uh, like almost two lakhs people losing jobs uh, when google announced layoffs uh, it was like a setback for the industry uh, amazon people didn't really i mean no one from amazon here but i'm not offending them uh but google really had that respect from an, from employee centricity when they let go so many people uh they it was a bit of a setback uh, so people are actually worried uh, talent is really worried that you know should, would i un- unfortunately be a part of the last and first out list uh i am stable in my company right now uh should i go and is it the right time for me to take this adventure or not should i wait for a year so i think all those uh, uh stigmas would continue to happen until there is a mass mobility mobility what i mean is this job changes etc happen and they happen you see people putting that on linkedin etc so i think that confidence needs to be built in the talent community before they start doing it um yeah so so i think that's that's my observations been for so far um but yeah I, i think great looking forward to this discussion and and seeing you know how i can contribute to it as well Awesome. Um, Actually, thanks. I was, uh, Avinash, I was, uh, I was really excited, and I was a little worried as well. But that in here, I mean, the my Kamal and I are the only tech people. Then Harsha joined in, so but looking forward to some learnings on EV as well. Awesome, great, great. Welcome. Last, uh, we have uh, Fabian. Fabian, over to you. Just a quick intro and a little bit about you know what you do and uh, how was the last uh, year or the current year that's going, and then you know the future. What does it hold for? Mm-hmm. good morning uh, avinash and my fellow panelists um, i think it's, it's absolutely a pleasure and i was sharing a couple of you share your thoughts and insights very very insightful so i'm looking forward to carry away many more tips as we sort of move along so uh, my name is fabian i lead the uh, integrated resourcing or the talent acquisition function for shell um as you may know shell is an oil and gas company close to about 150 years of a legacy that we sort of work with um and i think at this point in time if you sort of look at it um if you look at our priorities i think it's about energy prioritization and energy transition both of it man in the managing both of it at the same time um and i think from a prioritization point of view it's about how we sort of rebalance what we are seeing as um you know fallouts of um you know, the ukraine war and how do we ensure that there's a sustainable energy that is can be provided to people across the globe i think that's that's a priority for us and as we focus on this we are also using this opportunity to sort of transition ourselves into um you know and i have been to talk about this um you know into the ev space um, we are one of um, the largest ev providers service providers in china uh, and as, as well as north america uh, behind tesla of course and uh, i think that's the scenario that we continue to sort of focus on uh, even in india at this point in time you would probably see shell connect uh, in most of the banks uh, if you're especially if you're in bangalore um, that's something that we have a very good penetration over there um i think on the other side uh, as we sort of manage that we're also looking at um, how do we sort of rebalance the energy needs from an lng point of view i think that's the space that we are working in and of course hydrogen um uh, supposed to sort of leave those for another right um i think that's that's where we are um if you look at shell in india it's close it's it's close to about 20% of overall shell headcount across the globe um and i think that goes to show and indicate the organization's deep rooted trust that india has excellent talent that i think um, it's a testament to the way we sort of continue to build um, um You know, I think um, I heard Harsha also talk about this. I think if there is a tech job, I think India is, and if there's a tech job that needs to sort of scale, India is really the place. And I think that's sort of founded, and I think that's re-emphasized by uh, the kind of investments that we're seeing across uh, the next organizations. I think Shell is not different from that. 
um, our largest footprint here in in, uh, in India is of course IT, followed by um, we also have a research facility over here, uh, followed by oil and gas and finance services as well. Right, um, the oldest entity is the finance services space, but um, biggest entity is the IT services. Uh, if I have to look back and reflect on 2023, I think um, um, I think 2022 was a tumultuous year for most of us. Um, I think I, I heard um, everybody sort of allude to it in some shape or form. Uh, it was really a war for talent. Um, but I think 2023 has been a year where things have, at least for us, begun to settle down. Um, the latter half of 2023, I think, has also been a, year, a part of the year where uh, talent mobility is sort of slowing down. You see a lot of um, organizations sort of let go of people. Um, and I think that has also sort of reshaped the way talent sort of moves around the market, uh, at least for the skills that we hire. Um, we are still, from an attrition point of view, we are very, very low single digit, very low single digit, I think. Um, um, and I think that also is a testament to the EVP or the employer value proposition that the organization sort of offers. Um, and I think um, we have always, I think last year was an aberration where we were upper single digits, but this year we were very, very low single digits. Um, and I think that's that uh, as we sort of continue to grow in these particular spaces, I think we want to ensure that, um, you know, we, we continue to invest in, in the IT, especially in areas like data science, uh, software engineering. I think these are areas that we will continue to invest in, especially in India. Uh, and of course, um, continue to focus on cost because I think cost optimization is the order of the day. I think uh, we recognize that um, it's no longer wise to make hay while the sun shines. Even when the sun shines, it is about how much you can save as well. So while food is still trading at about $85, $90, bread is trading at about $85, $90 a barrel, I think it's still very, very prudent that cost optimization is the order of the day because you need to save as much money as you possibly can today for when there's a rainy day. So I think that's um, that's something that we're sort of uh, focusing on. So um, if, if you looked at the way we have sort of, uh, I mean, the kind of jobs that we sort of operated, I think we are no longer doing, I mean, Shell was never a, a, a player in the, in the mass market hiring side. We were very choiceful about, you know, what and how much we hired and who we hired. Um, and I think that is sort of further now streamlined. And I think that we are now we're sort of looking at really, you know, how much we can op automate and the ones that we cannot automate, how do you sort of bring in people who can sort of help us and enable that journey for us, which are basically skills for us in the future. So I think this has been um, the journey thus far, uh, 2023. I think 2024 is going to be uh, a fairly interesting period as, from an energy point of view, at least. Um, as, as uh, there's far more technology innovation in this particular space, um, and Shell continues to invest in this, uh, I think that's that's an area that we continue to we will continue to see how it sort of evolves as we move along. But I think it's about, as I mentioned, energy prioritization. Thank you. Welcome, Parvin. So I think um, across board, what we're hearing is uh, you know caution to some extent, right? And then um, you know. I think uh, some of the you know global trends um, that are uh, evolving uh, from a talent acquisition recruitment standpoint uh, is um, integrating Gen AI in 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 the recruitment talent acquisition or you know to do the mundane aspects of it. Um, the other one is you know I mean some of it of course has been spoken here uh, across the table. Um, of course, embracing hybrid, you know, after pandemic, I think that's that's a given. But I think that kind of continues to be how you know the workplace is kind of evolving. Um, and then you know the other trend is um, you know early careers hiring. Um, so that's another key area which most organizations are looking at. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, optimizing costs, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, and and one of the key uh, aspects also has been on providing positive candidate experience, right? I mean, right from your application process to candidate engagement, you know, and all of that, right? Um, and employer branding, of course, continues to be the key um, and employee retention, some of you kind of spoke. Can we dwell in a little bit in terms of, you know, I mean, how, um, you know, some of these have really kind of impacted? What is it that you've kind of done within your organizations if there are any 
you know cases that you want to kind of point out so that you know we all can learn from one another and uh, and, and and then if you're looking at you know kind of experimenting something and if somebody else has uh, uh, you know kind of uh, some cases to talk about uh, that'll be great so uh, I, this can be a free flowing discussion um, yeah i think uh, we'll uh, because harsha has raised his hand we'll start with harsha and then we can go around uh, here over to yeah. you harsha. so two three points and what you just said right i mean harsha's generative ai technology is picking up and uh, everybody irrespective of uh, the domain that they are in technology space that they are in irrespective of the profession that they are in be it, whether it is for hr or for ta or for tech folks uh, it is looked at as though it is going to take away their job right but let's do a deep dive right so especially for talent acquisition what i have seen is it has always been an operation operation intensive task right for talent acquisition starting from sourcing to uh, curating messages uh, during the interview process sending out messages after every interview level to the post offer engagement to offer conversation to the first 60 days 90 days or whatever it is it is an operation intensive task because i'm only talking till there because that's what talent acquisition teams mostly want right but think of it right so talent acquisition teams are today looking at generative ais to curate best in class job descriptions best in class reach out messages to hyper personalized messaging but the same technologies are also available to the candidates today you see best in class profiles as well because same generative technology generative ai technologies are helping candidates to create custom fit profiles to job descriptions that you have out there but what is the value add that ta teams have today right so if your profiles are as good as the job descriptions you are just taking profiles and pushing it as only to see that during the interview process they don't meet the expectation so the crux of the matter is how do you provide more proof of work generate more proof of work that's the concept that we are embracing at really right so one can you use same generative ai technologies to have a varied set of questions that will help you screen better and also can you use same generative ai technologies to try and positioning message position messaging to attract only right talent so because i i mentioned some time before as well the war is for the top talent because the top talent need is also because the speed at which you are required to move solutions into the market and products into the market is much higher compared to past you can't afford to train it is still a build versus buy uh, conflict but still a lot of it is still a buy strategy for most of the organizations right when the need of the hour is to deliver solutions faster so this is one thing that i see talent acquisition teams train to master in right and how do you curate and maintain external talent communities which is basically your external talent bench or what people call as uh, uh, talent communities so i still remember my early days of recruitment we we had one of the largest mainframe communities uh, in india we had hundreds of people uh, for mainframe of course uh, i mean mainframe comes from a lot of it comes from ibm but how do you consistently manage and do that is the key right as per generative ai technology is a concept so and today another thing that you rightly spoke about branding right what's happening is like i mentioned earlier you are hiring at one end the last uh, few months have been layoffs across the organization how do you make sure the messaging is right it's all the more important to have a well curated evp which is more realistic you can't you can't have uh, values that are not real you can't say that we believe in pay parity but there are differences in the gender pay uh, right and you can't say we believe in employee well being and your employees are working in 12 13 14 hour shift right so you can't message certain things out without actually leaving it so i have a say which says your customer experience should be as good as your employee experience your employee experience should be as good as your customer experience and go a step further and say your candidate experience should be as good as your employee experience and customer experience so in simple words the equation is candidate experience equal to employee experience equal to customer experience your brand positioning should be that okay if there are any inconsistent inconsistencies in this it is very unlikely that candidates are going to buy uh, right buy your opportunity or no matter how good your sell is they're going to join you right how do you do this over a period of time especially when you are hiring lateral is extremely important and of course top talent like i said is experience agnostic it is someone who is nimble agile learn uh, technology uh, at speed and then execute things right it, and most of it is coming from early talent uh, careers today in the past in the organization that i have been uh, at least palabella Uh, we were investing in curating certain curriculum at universities where we co-create the curriculum which is custom fit to retail as an industry and technologies that we uh, intend to hire for at brillio also campus is one of our uh, 
biggest feeder in terms of talent, right? Here we work with universities, try and give them ahead of time information in terms of which are the areas wherein we want to invest, okay? If there is any SMEs that are available, can we do certain sessions, help students learn these skills, pick up real-time capabilities and come on board much more prepared. And today, as we speak, we're doing a, a hackathon. Most of the hackathon use cases are industry-based, real-time use cases. Of course, not revealing the customer details, not uh, revealing, uh, I mean, uh, sensitive information, but of course, definitely revealing enough for them to understand what is the need of the hour. I think this is where the trend is, uh, and this is where uh, we should all focus on. Fantastic, Harsha. So before we kind of get to the next, uh, you know, person, we have uh, Sahil who's joined us. Um, Sahil, um, if you could just introduce yourself uh, to the panel. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Abhinash. Uh, very good morning to each one of you. Uh, apologies, give me a couple of minutes and I'll be back on camera. But I wanted to wish everybody a very, very happy festive season. I hope you had a great Diwali with all your family members and loved ones. Uh, my name is Sahil Nair and I'm a Senior Associate Director with KPMG. Um, wonderful being here. I, I guess it'll be nice to get to know all of you and of course some very familiar faces here as well on the screen. Uh, so nice to connect and thank you for having me over. Welcome, welcome Sahil. Great. Um, so yeah, um, yes, uh, Augustus, you want to kind of go or Venkat? Yeah, okay. please. Yeah. I think, I think you, you specifically spoke about Jinai. Gen AI, see, Gen AI has got a, a you know, wonderful application from, you know, talent acquisition, from screening of uh, profiles to the final interview to onboarding. There are a variety number of uh, users for uh, Gen AI. And I think I think it depends on the scale of recruitment, what you want to do with uh, Gen AI. Uh, it also depends on the industry which you come from. If you ask me what we have done in Gen AI for the last two, three years, uh, Basically, we have done in our campus recruitments, basically, uh, you know, uh, in terms of large scale uh, uh, recruitment, how do we understand a student in terms of set of competencies? Uh, some AI algorithm we have used and tried to understand where do they stand in different set of competencies, especially the competency for uh, students who are, who are to be taken as GET. So that's one area. And second area in terms of assessment, for example, you know, you can't make uh, senior leaders to go through assessment for a day, two day, and then uh, you know, get the report and try to understand where do they stand. Especially it's not a uh, selection tool, but still a development tool where we have cut short this uh, assessment to, uh, you know, two to three hours, uh, combining with uh, some of the top names in uh, the areas of assessment. And we had uh, uh, Gen AI incorporated into it and cut short the assessment to three to four hours. And the report, what we are getting is uh, says a complete validated report. And when we compare with the, you know, long period assessment and this assessment, it is more or less, uh, you know, similar and, and, and uh, correlation is uh, perfect. So these two areas, we have uh, specifically worked in uh, Ashok Leland in GNA. If you ask me, is, is it uh, the uh, end of it? No, we are open to it because wherever we find issues, we want to actively incorporate GNA into our uh, uh, system, the way we do things. And uh, manufacturing specifically uh, will have different challenges compared to other panel members who have spoken about uh, you know, their, their industry. So in that context, we are open to it. Wherever it is required, we'll try to incorporate into our scheme of things. And at this point of time, these are the two limited areas which we have worked. And there's a scope in terms of even, uh, you know, onboarding, how effectively we onboard using this uh, Gen AI. And uh, coming to uh, branding, uh, I, think, I think there's a lot of scope to use in the branding too. You know, this, this is a limited scope, yeah. All right, we got uh, August, as you want to go. Oh, yeah, thank you so much, um, Avinash. And hey, Sahil, nice to see you here. Uh, Sahil and I um, have been on various such forums, and he's been my partner in crime. So good to have someone here. 
<laughs> okay. So um, I, I think I'm going to go back to, uh, you know, some of the learnings, okay? Um, and the pet peeve, all right? 2020, I think we got a kick in the pants in terms of how we transform our businesses, working remotely uh, with a fragmented workforce, all right? And then we want to very quickly forget it and go back to a traditional way of working. And I think, first of all, we need to drive the transformation, all right? And what undergirds this transformation, all right, is technology. You've all spoken about it. So I'm not going to spend a more time in terms of generative AI and what it can do for the TA business. But I think we have that. But again, alongside that, primarily what comes is the core to our business is people, right? So when, when you are saying people are core to your business, how are we going and, uh, and you know, stating it, all right, from, let's say, call it from an employer branding perspective or whatever the case may be. Um, one way of doing it is to articulate uh, how your people are faring and why you should join us. And that brings me to something called purpose, all right? Purpose-driven work is what we need to drive. And before that, we also need to embrace the different types of talent that is available, one of them being the gig workforce, all right? And a lot of us are also a bit reticent in terms of saying, hey, the gig uh, could be moonlighting and so on and so forth. Well, every business, every process has its own risk and challenge. And I think it's the job of the manager and the business to ensure that, hey, we've got to avoid people who are doing this. But at the same time, we cannot miss out on that talent because a lot of you have rightly said it's a war for talent. OK, and you have said that, you know, how do I go for the. Uh, for the top talent, right? you go for the top talent and then you have, uh, let's say, the, the great um, attrition, like you, uh, like you said earlier, Avinash, is that when the great attrition happened, what happened? Top talent is a flight risk, all right? So the more you go and attract top talent, the greater is your flight risk. So I think there needs to be some, some mix, and I would call it the workforce mix. Your workforce mix has got to have those components that are readily available like the gig come in do the work have it in a controlled environment address your data and integrity and ethics issues the way you would want it but don't say hey this is going to be a high risk for me we run critical applications to financial institutions the world over okay and i'm not saying we're using a lot of gig workforce but we are thinking that way we want to get that that constituency, okay? So workforce makes sense. And coming back to purpose is purpose is again driven by culture, all right? Now, after coming away from a 112 year legacy organization and then building a, a, a kind of a startup with a $19 billion revenue is no easy task, all right? Because year on year, 20 to 30% of your workforce is going to be new. And in about three years, you actually got all your workforce who are new. So therefore, what is that culture or the stickiness that's going to keep people within me, all right? I'll come to that in the next round. But before that, I spoke about purpose. And I'll give you a very quick metaphor in terms of purpose and why we tell people, look, this is why you need to join. For example, uh, we take Rukmani. Rukmani is, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a coder in Java and has been working for many, many years. And then Rukmani one fine day decides to put in her papers. She goes to a manager and says, hey, I want to quit. And the manager says, why? I'm pretty surprised you uh, would like to quit. She says, no, I'm, I'm going to quit. But what are you going to do after that? I'm joining this airline company. Why would you join an airline company, Rukmani? Because you care about clean air. So airlines are um, the highest polluters, right? So Rukmini says, well, that's exactly the point why I'm going to join this airline company because... I am going to help reduce their carbon footprint. Every line of Java code that I'm going to be writing is going to reduce that footprint and, and drive them to a carbon neutrality over a fine period of years. And therefore, what happens is that what work I am doing resonates with my value system. All right. And therefore, I'm deeply engaged in what I'm doing. All right. So that helps my wellness. That helps me engage better. That improves my stickiness. And also it helps me assimilate better with my network. Also, 
since I've joined this company, that's the job for only two days a week. What are you going to be doing the next three days? You decide, Mr. Manager, I can work for you for three days. So what happens here? She transformed into a gig worker. She is into a purpose-driven work. She is very well engaged. And it also helps in her wellness and well-being, both emotionally as well as physically. So I think that is the narrator some of us seem to be missing. And that could be core to what we want to do. Thank you. Fantastic uh, points there, uh, you know, Augustus. Uh, Sail, you want to come in, uh, bring in some perspective there? Uh. Sure. Akinash, apologies. I joined in a couple of minutes late. So maybe if you just want to give me a quick context uh, on, uh, I, well, I've heard the other speakers, but it'll be helpful to me so I can be on point. So we're talking about, you know, broad trends that are, you know, kind of evolving from a Gen AI to, you know, embracing hybrid work to early careers to positive candidate experience, employer brand, employer retention, et cetera. So these are broad, um, you know, trends that are evolving. Um, so just want to kind of hear from your side uh, at KPMG, what is it that you guys are doing? And, uh, you know, what are some of the things that have kind of really helped uh, KPMG as an organization. Sure. So maybe I'll pick up each of the keywords that you really touched upon and then uh, take it up from there. Um, to start off with, I think it, as far as early careers are concerned, uh, we've been heavily investing in this space. Um, I think long enough, each one of us has spent enough time hiring from India. And I've said this at multiple forums in the past as well, that it's high time we start building capability and intent to hire from Bharat. Now, when we start talking about hiring from Bharat, it sounds very fancy. And over the last couple of weeks, uh, there's a political twist to it as well. So I'll stay away from that. But uh, what I will definitely comment on is if I look at it from an organization's point of view, you have limited time, you have limited resources, and you want to pick up the best of talent. Uh, very easy to do it in the engineering space. You launch a hackathon, the whole world applies. It's a, it's a democratized platform where anybody can go through it. Uh, but keep the engineers aside, uh, management roles, this, that, and the other. I don't think we have still cracked the code on uh, how is it that you can actually hire people uh, through democratizing it across the country. So that's point number one. Uh, the challenge becomes how do you really find a needle in a haystack? Okay. Um, and uh, I think that becomes a significant challenge and therefore we find it very safe to go to pedigree institutions where we know quality is assured. So I think as far as early careers is concerned, Problem statement number one is how do you go to Bharat? Hire from Bharat, keeping everything else equal. And even before you go to Bharat and hire from Bharat, the question is, do you believe that you could find, uh, just for the lack of a better word, uh, Sundar Pichai sitting in Rauhela? Okay. And if you don't believe that, then there is a problem. Because you're not going to have every big landmark name coming out from IM, ABC, right? Uh, and that's why when you saw the cynics uh, talking about IMK being in the top three, uh, they played out very differently. So that's the one challenge as far as early careers is concerned. Second, uh, I think all of us have been so fortunate that we've seen tables turn in a matter of quarters. What do I really mean? Uh, an employer's market to an employee's market, back to an employer's market. At least I have never seen tables turn so quickly, right? Uh, from where a candidate would negotiate, not on his or her last CTC, but on his or her last offer. And say, I have given seven interviews. I still have one month left of my notice period. You are the eighth employer where I'm applying and I've already got a 130% hike on my current CTC, will you give me a 150% hike, right? To the same techie, six months later, saying I've been laid off, I'm okay coming at a 50% cut on my last run, will you give me a job, right? 
So I think the law of karma has played out beautifully. Uh, the whole aspect of employer branding, uh, to my mind, became a race to the bottom. And the reason why I say it became a race to the bottom was because uh, it was just about money. And you may say, Sahil, you're segmenting this just into one segment of the entire industry. So be it. But the larger point that I'm trying to make is employer branding is no longer about paid reviews on Glassdoor. Employer branding is no longer about fancy LinkedIn posts. Employer branding is about calling up a Harsha or a Kirit or an Augie or a Kamal and say, hey, Kamal, uh, or Fabian, hey, you know, we met last week. Uh, you know, this is one kid from your team who's applied. And do you think it makes sense? Uh, what should I do? Right. Or it's the kid going back to Fabian and saying, hey, you know what? I interviewed with Sahil. I saw a picture of you and Sahil at a conference last week. You have been my mentor at Shell. Uh, is Sahil a good guy to work with? So Sahil's reference check as a potential boss or a potential employer happens through Fabian, not just the organization doing a reference check on the candidate in terms of school, education, previous employment, so on and so forth. And the third tectonic shift that I see happening very clearly is very fancy words, right? Gen AI, AI, ML. And trust me, I've, I've really tested this out with a lot of people. The moment you scrape the surface a bit, it is shallow. It is so shallow. You talk about data sets, you talk about big data, you talk about bias in Gen AI. Upar upar ki baatein, all of us are brilliant at it, right? Because we read up, we do stuff, whatever. Even if you talk to the kids on the block, they're amazing. They'll go on a chat GPT, they'll prepare for a session, they'll give you great gyan. But if you get into the details and just scrape the epidermis a bit, I think there is an ocean waiting out there for us to understand how does this impact talent? How does this impact the future of work? And how disruptive is this going to be in a mindset where a classic example was COVID, where managers who had the mindset of, I want to have this person in front of my nose, sit right outside my cabin, today is sitting in Manali, sitting in New York, sitting anywhere, but delivering output. But since I can't see the guy or girl, I don't think the guy is working. So from measuring input to measuring output, we've covered a distance. Now the question is, is the output coming because a Manu or an Avinash is putting that hard work? Or is the output coming because Avinash is saying, listen, I don't need to work eight hours a day. I have a tool available that gives me an output in 10 minutes. I use the next one hour to make sense out of it and add my point of view. And the remaining seven hours, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm anyway giving the output. Versus, and you know, a Jalit sitting in office for eight hours and saying, hey, you know what? I've been burning the midnight oil. I've done this. I've crossed this data. I've spoken to 10 people, blah, blah, blah. So I'm saying the point I'm trying to drive home is, are we measuring the right metric or are we not? I'll take a pause here. I can go on and on, but I'm sure there are other speakers, but I want to take a pause here. But these are the three tectonic shifts that I see happening as far as the future of work is concerned. Very, very valid and pertinent uh, points there, Sahil. Um, yeah, I mean, anyone else, Jaljit, Fabian, or uh, Kamal, want to come in? Yeah, I will just share one uh, one um, initiative that we took, uh, though not going to touch a lot about other topics, but uh, the uh, early career uh, was an imperative. We had to go uh, and hire freshers uh, more to keep our pyramid uh, you know, uh, in shape in terms of the headcount, the workforce that we had. Um, so what we have done is that uh, we have uh, tied up with um, university, you know, the um, the university in Kerala. In fact, then the, it's called the Kerala Technological University, which and all the engineering schools are affiliated to their to this university. So we tied up with them, and uh, we kind of proposed uh, electives, right? So to keep are uh, the students more uh, industry ready? You know, many a times we hire, we don't find the right skills, you know, with readily available. And then we have to take them through a boot camp and keep them, make them ready to be deployed uh, on projects or whatever it is. 
So that was one uh, proactive step. So we went ahead and we reached out to uh, one of the autonomous colleges. We said, let's start with somewhere. You know, it's not that we can scale up across, but at least let's start with one. And then we went to them and we spoke, and they were happy to have uh, a, a, a elective of you know, offered by us, you know, as a paper. So which means, so the course is more aligned with what we are doing, and then you can. Uh, the kids get trained on that and uh, that's also a way of branding you know and reaching out to the uh, uh, the uh, you know the students and uh, that was that made it a lot made a lot of sense both ways and then we we've on that journey now and then uh, we have kind of tying up with them signing an mou right now and then moving forward so this could help i think uh, to kind of get the right kind of uh, fraternity out there and then make them ready for to be hired you know, into your company. So this could be something uh, everyone can try. Thank you. Um, Fabian, we'll come back to you, Harsha, just in a bit after Fabian. Is Harsha going first? Uh, you, you, you go first and then okay. next. Just yeah. uh, to share a little bit about a couple of things that we're testing at this point in time, which I'll um, in the AI space, right? I think um, one piece is, which we have already begun to implement is, uh, we have a specific in-house tool um, that is available to all managers because our managers are the ones who sort of curate job descriptions because we feel that they are closest to uh, what they know what they want, right? So, but just to ensure that there are guardrails around what we want from an organization point of view and what we want to keep from an organization point of view, I think. Um, and so this tool that is available for the managers to sort of go in and share with them, you know, uh, it just sort of puts out certain outlines in terms of competencies and stuff like that. And this tool sort of then scrapes through uh, the entire organization that this manager sort of works with and then curates um, content for a job description. And this then um, also is ensured that there is no bias right, um, towards a specific gender in the way this sort of gets curated and stuff like that. So I think that's that's an area that we're testing at this point in time. It's been about six, seven or months that we're sort of working with this, but we'll probably need to see how the efficacy of it has to sort of over on. Um, I think the other bit that we're sort of testing in this space is uh, because in Shell, uh, the resourcing team manage both um, internal and external resourcing, I think you're sort of coming up with what we are calling a skills hub, right? Um, and this is to sort of look at um, the 90,000 people sitting across the globe to sort of see, and if you have jobs being posted across, we want to ensure that people have the mobility to sort of move around and provide them with that and be able to give them an opportunity to say where they will fit, you know, looking at the skills that they possess and for example if they want to if there is a specific career laddering that they're looking at how they sort of need to sort of go there and i think this is where the, the tool that we're sort of looking at uses uh gen ai to sort of um, one look at it sort of scrapes through their cv it goes through the skills that they have uh it sort of compares that with what the present day market has um for that current market that they're in and how they sort of compare with that particular market that they're working in uh, it looks at the team that they are part of and where those skills sort of fit in, what is whether they are at uh, a beginner, intermediate or a mastery and sort of gives them a sort of a dashboard in that particular sense, giving them a good sense and understanding of how competitive they will be for the job that they're going to apply to. So that's a space that we are testing uh, at this point in time, uh, probably somewhere 2024 is where we see that this is sort of going to um get rolled out right now it's in the uat for specific skill pools that we want to see how this sort of and we'll see how it sort of works out for them right uh, because um because i think in the oil and gas space we're sort of looking at uh, it's like not just one skill right it's like um close to about the disciplines alone are close to about 67 disciplines that we sort of manage so there's a tremendous amount of these smaller skills that we sort of going at. Um, and I think um, I think this is, that's on the Gen AI piece, right? If I touch upon the other two pieces um, around employer branding, uh, and I think this is this is now sort of reshaped in terms of how we are looking at it. 
Um, so far, I think the thrust has always been on the employer or on the organization to ensure that people upskill themselves. It's about professional development is the line manager's problem and they need to be accountable for what they want to do. But I think now we're sort of moving away from that to say that your development is in your hands. You choose where you want to go. And I think this is where the skills tool also sort of comes in to sort of play into it, sort of speaks to each other. Um, because what we have sort of said is if you want to go somewhere, you decide in terms of the, the part that you want to chart. Your, your line manager, the organization is no longer going to do this for you because we recognize that everybody is unique in their own way and you, just, you know what you want the best. So at this point in time, we are sort of working on and we have redesigned our EVP to say that professional development is in your hands and you sort of decide how and where you want to go and at what pace you want to go as well. Of course, the organization will set out certain guardrails, um, you know, uh, form, you know, in terms of skills, competencies, leadership, development, and so on and so forth. But that's that's about it. Um, and I think that's a tectonic shift in moving away from your typical classroom training. And I do this, this, this from an employee EVP point of view to say that you decide in terms of if you want to grow the technical way, perfectly okay with you. We have a career ladder that is available for you. This is what you need to do to sort of move into a global discipline head. If you want to go into people management, this is what you want to do. If you want to move into you know, business development and stuff like that. So I think that's that's a fundamental shift in the employee value proposition. Uh, and when we talk about employee branding in the external world, all of our job descriptions also allude to that. Say that you know your development is in your hands and you choose where you want to go once you come into the shelf. Um, and I think finally on the, I think on, we were talking about early career hiring. I think this has been a space that um, most organizations, and I mean, I was, uh, I spent time at TCS and in and I think most of these organizations you know, has very, very heavily in that bottom of the pyramid to sort of build that. Shell is no different. Um, but I think we have been, um, you know, a little, I think where we have sort of reshaped the way we have operated is the fact that we no longer, you know, have, we no longer believe that uh, we should only go to Ivy League schools, right? We have recognized that good talent sits across the country and we need to ensure that it's a level playing field for everyone. And this is where, um, you know, we have used, we have sort of tried and testing various tools with, whether it is with Unstop, whether it's with Mercer Metal, to see how we can tap into talent that sits across the country. Um, right. I, I heard Sahil talk about uh, hackathon. I think that gives you gives talent an amazing platform to just come together and really and let the the real good talent sort of shine above the rest, rather than being confined to to a university or a set of universities. I think that's the way we sort of operated, and and as we sort of move along to this journey, I think that's something that we will continue to leverage far more. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Over to you, Harsha. Yeah, so uh, taking on from where Sahil and uh, uh, Augustus left, right? Uh, all of us want top talent, uh, but what are we doing to make sure that that top talent is given enough opportunities to stay within the organization? Because what happens is historical uh, parameters of somebody's performance have been, okay, so managers are used to seeing people sit at office, clock nine, ten hours, slog and show efforts, right? What are we really measuring? That matrix that Sahil spoke about is extremely important. You Are you measuring efforts or are you measuring outcomes, right? If you start measuring outcomes, you will see that what, what you consider as a performance is actually happening, but you're just not seeing it. You're not feeling it, right? That's the first thing, right? There's a lot of reverse learning that is required. A conventional manager who is uh, who's used to seeing people put in clock in hours, uh, changing the mindset to see what individual aspirations are, what technologies and what career streams that they're interested in, be a real coach, right? That is a mindset sh mindset shift that is required. And I think there's a reverse learning required. I don't think it is going to happen over a period of one, two, three years, but it is it is a gradual learning process, right? One of the things that we're doing at Billio today is, see, hey, I understand you, all of you need best in class top talent in each project, but uh, consider your cost of buying that talent as well, right? It is huge. What are we doing? What are you doing to bridge that gap? How are you equipping your existing talent to learn new skills and scale up and become more useful over a period of time? So we have a skill matrix, right? Everybody defines the skills and their competence in each of those skills. They also put skills in that matrix. 
that they aspire to learn the career trajectory that they want to take so now imagine over a period of time what we think is build a layer on the top of that every time there is a, an opportunity that we are trying to hire of course it is futuristic right in 2 3 6 months time this is a new technology areas that we are trying to invest in if anybody is interested you have you have this much time to learn these capabilities and apply for these opportunities and the layer on the top of this if you have apply, i mean if you have gained these skills and if you rate yourself uh, higher on this tool will map and say okay these are the people that are available in your organizations lying in these 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 projects who could be considered for this opportunity i think this mindset 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 change is also required among leadership hr business partnering teams and talent acquisition teams it cannot be just outbound right it also has to be inbound okay not just from an inbound application standpoint but also evaluation standpoint so that that's one point that i wanted to touch base uh, on uh, avinash thank you thank you thank you asha uh, when cut uh, yeah but just just a quick one because a uh, couple of points by uh, you know augustus and uh, sai triggered uh, the uh, couple of best practices which we implemented in last two two and a half years one is on the you know early career uh somewhere you know when the organization is going to a transition and you have different uh, you know business landscape hitting us and you have uh, changed environment across you will always find organization coming out with you know we need 250 people 300 people 350 people down the line for us to take up this and all all uh, of hr you know they just jump make uh, talent available as quickly as possible and make it happen for the organization we did a reverse thing you know in the sense uh, when there was a requirement we put into the strategic workforce planning over a period of time and we defined the jobs is the job is is continuous or it is only a challenge so if we differentiate between job and the challenge and believe me 40% of the requirement came as a challenge it was a typical one challenge which the organization has to overcome being a uh, uh, newer software to be developed or beat some uh you know test records to be validated there were number of challenges which was coming out and not the job actually so in that context what we did was you know let, let us have a interns from different top institute and then we'll go for a bigger stipend and give them the uh, you know difficult challenges and projects through to this interns and let them deliver in 6 to 8 months and if we can cut across this you know your 30 40% of your new requirement can be done by the interns in themselves unless until you have a you need to have a leadership pipeline you need to have a gt recruited otherwise you know you can do this job with the interns so that was one awakening which had happened in the last couple of years and we had a process put in place for engaging interns and giving them challenging projects and that's proving to be uh, very very beneficial for the organization that's one second uh, i think i think at a brilliant point touched by uh, you know augustus again on the purpose values and the culture what we are building in uh, we also embarked on a cultural journey in the last uh, one and a half years uh, somewhere again the business context so far we have been digital in company so far we have been work the way which was convenient for us because there were two three major players and didn't have much of a challenge in the market now the entire landscape has changed do the culture what we practice is going to take us to the next 25 years there was the question asked from the board to a senior leadership from across the organization because we found agility is one area which we have not actually concentrated because agility you know we we were process driven and we were mostly person driven is it agility coming to the forefront in the activities in the process what we do there was a major gap and we re- revisited our values we revisited our purpose and came out with the entire organization will be assimilating these values into them and see the work through these values so like augustins augustus thought of brilliantly whether my personal values getting aligned to the organization values in that context my longevity my retention is ensured with the organization that's a major exercise which we did we are in the process of you know having this values across the organization people knowing about this values and conducting training session about this values and slowly going forward the next 3 4 years we want to integrate entire process aligning to this values all hr process all the manufacturing process all the r&d process will be integrated into this values if i talk about agility that's my process that's my practices aligned to agility i cannot talk about agility unless as this practice sir aligned to the value what i'm talking about these are the two major exercises which we did uh, last year which was 
uh, you know, beneficial for the organization on the lines of what, you know, Sahil and Agastya spoke. Just clicked into my mind, I thought I can share here. Fantastic, uh, Venkat. Two, two aspects, um, interns and then the cultural shift, which had to be done from a legacy organization to the agility that you had to bring in for to change to cope with the, you know, competitive environment out there. Um, Augustus. Yeah, so a uh, quick one to uh, continue with what uh, our friends have said and especially what um, Michael touched upon. We embarked on a transformation journey. And I'll tell you why and move away from the word transformation. We uh, launched a project called Powering People Progress, Powering Human Progress. So what did this do? This basically was a renovation of our talent strategy, okay? All put together, okay? External and uh, hiring as well as internal, all right? And then alongside that were, were skills upgradation, upskilling and reskilling. Now, what did it do? Given a fragmented workforce and with people being, you know, an out of sight, out of mind kind of a scenario, how do I make talent visible to managers for them to hire these people, all right? So powering people's progress was typically this, um, driven by technology, a huge digital platform, where people can be visible while you are hiring for a project. So whether it's a project in the pipeline or whether it's an ongoing project, looking at both skills externally as well as internally. And if somebody is 70% there, what does it take for him to get to that visible level where he can still be considered, he or she, all right, uh, can still be considered? So I think the digital experience is very, very important here. And about integrating all your other HR analytics, generative AI, learning, skills, and so on and so forth into one platform where you expose the person, give them that opportunity to be visible to the marketplace out there. And that to a very large extent helped us in two main aspects. A, engagement. B, once again, culture and be putting people at the core of our business. Thank you. So, so I'd want probably, you know, Kirit, um, Kamal, you can share your views and then we quickly get into the next section. We'll just have another 30 minutes to go. Yeah, I was absorbing as much as I could from the great conversation, but I, I, I mean, I was just taking some notes as well. Sahil, I can't agree more with you on the on the shallowness of AI, uh, because you know I think uh, unfortunately, uh, you know some of the organizations and and these are like small organizations trying to help a talent acquisition with certain offerings or products, etc. Uh, I, I think there's a there's it's not a fine line difference, uh, but it's a thick line difference between optimization and intelligence. Right, and that's where uh, you know the AI thing is going wrong, right? So if, if uh, just to be honest, folks, so you know, I a few uh, you know set a set of new founders who are trying to do something in the recruiting space using AI, etc., did consult me on my ideas, you know, what they should build, etc. But um, I I was brutal in some conversations that I said you're just trying to optimize things, you're automating actually but you're not adding any intelligence to it, right? So if you tell me that, you know, your assessment, you're giving me an assessment or something which is which is going to save me two days of candidates, it's it's an assessment platform, but tell me where is the intuitive power there, right? Um, then on the university side, there's some AI that's coming in and someone told me, I had a laugh actually, you know, we go to IIT Bombay. Imagine we go to IIT Bombay and you meet 100 students. Out of those 100 students, I'll give you the top 30. Now I'm going to IIT Bombay and seeing 100 students. The academic scores of those 100 students is going to be 2x of my life scores, right? So, I mean, though they are already top, so I don't need to find the top 30 in them. So I think this area really needs, um, Sahil, I don't know if you'd agree, but people need to think a little bit more. There has to be more spec-driven and a purpose-driven AI in TA or, you know, maybe at least to start with TA for that matter to make a, make a difference. But the other part is that what, what we probably should take to our teams is that uh, AI is not going to, if, if, if there's a tool implementation or inclusion, right, uh, it's it's going to be a boon for the recruiters because 
your operational stuff is go will go off but we have enough time to create a great experience for candidates for stakeholders right you spend more time understanding what what a candidate is and what the ecosystem is you have more time to do more strategic stuff than just clearing your applicant tracking system creating trackers etc and and finding you know a needle in the haystack um, i definitely agree with the purpose driven part on uh, the what augustus said before exiting um, so, folks, I'll give you a small example. Uh, Razorpay is an OKR-driven organization, and uh, OKR means there are numbers to everything. But the top line is not about, hey, I want to be like 99.999 bar percent live on every pay pay payment uh, transaction, right? Or I want to be, you know, like it's all, all number-driven, but how it becomes number-driven is because our goal in life is we want to be the most loved and trusted fintech company. And that is what people, you know, the young gen, see, we are a young company, right? The company is just eight years old. And in general, the uh, the average experience of employees is going to be like six, five and a half. No, that's too much, actually. Three, three and a half years. The founders, founders themselves with like eight years, seven, nine years experience. So, you know, that's how you, you we understood that how would people connect with this, right? What does this generation really need? And that's what is helping us excel in this, right? So people are actually getting connected with, hey, where am I in this journey to be the most loved and trusted fintech uh, organization in the world, right? And how do I contribute? And then that kind of percolates down, down into numbers. The, the generation today doesn't like numbers. Hey, give me something in two days, but it's more about how quick can we do this? Uh, so those conversations, those value propositions need to change. Um, Avinash, I feel uh, um, the university trend has already started taking an orbit shift a few years back, more than a few years back, right? Uh, I remember a company, I mean, a company guy, I was a part of Uber. Uh, you know, we used to do something called C++, and it was taken from a company, a book called C++, right? Let us see, which was written by Smita Kanetka. Um it was just, it was more of a women engineer related uh, initiative where we were actually telling them about some of the challenges in mobility and prepping them for this. And then they were going through a certain side of, you know, they were actually not putting, it was not a hackathon, right? But it was more of a simulation that they were creating to solve a mobility problem. And 60% of this audience was actually coming from non, uh, some of the schools that we've not heard about. This group, I mean, this group would have heard about but most of the people would not have heard about, right? So that, that uh, Sahil, I think that transformation from just the I, it's all the schools that start, start with an I and have a state name after them, or uh, yeah, a state name after them kind of, you know, changed. And uh, uh, that's, that's I think that orbit shift is coming. And uh, I think it's, it's you'll, we'll see more of it, uh, especially with more focus on internships, uh, we'll see less on-campus hiring going on and students getting placed even before you get there. And I think that's the best way to do it because you win the students trust if they like your culture, the work you've given them. They go back as the brand uh, manager, uh, sorry, the brand advocate for you, right? And and tell more people what about it, what's going to be. I'm fairly confident that probably a few years down the line, let's take it five years, there's hardly any company that's going to be visiting uh, these schools. Uh, companies that are like in mass uh, hiring from campuses would still be there, but the top notch is you're already losing that top talent from schools even before you actually fill in your job applicant form. So I think some of these things, Savinash, I feel uh, are to be watched out for. But one thing that I'm uh, particularly particularly watching out for and monitoring is, uh, I'm, it's easy to say monitoring, but kind of watching the trend is how AI is going to be, right? Uh, because uh, I have the tool to parse your resume. You have a tool to create the coolest resume, right? Uh, Harsha, you said something exactly the same. Thank you. Uh, but I need something super intelligent to tell me that this is where I need to do, right? So if Chad GPT today helps me put a presentation together, which will go and impress someone else, uh, I need something similar in probably every sphere of life, or at least the corporate thing, uh, it could be your people, uh, your recruiting scores. It could be your candidate NPS. Uh, we actually started using a great tool right now. Uh, it could be your employment experience, right? Like companies do these pulse surveys and whatever. You exactly need that intelligence where you go. Getting a tool doesn't mean that you're 
your your scores or your you know experience is going to go more or, or they they go, they rise up they spike up uh, but it's more important that you know what area do i need to go so ai should lead to some decision science not just text and uh, great vocab so awesome. those are my thoughts yeah. Thanks. Uh, with, uh, Kirit uh, Avinash and I have seen that in uh, my team as well when they have used some AI tools um, not too much of success right now how it is going to shape up is something that we need to look at uh, today predominantly it is just helping them get the top say you know if 400 people apply uh, they get through the AI uh, and the kind of uh, configurations that we have done on the tool, they get a ranking of the top 400 and they'll say, okay, let me pick the top 14 or 15 and then put them across to the interview process. Right? So that's one piece that is helping uh, the recruiters. And from a job seeker perspective, also I see that is helping them getting some bit of, you know, uh, right opportunities on their table uh, because of the keyword search match, et cetera, which has gotten better. Uh, but it is definitely not giving us uh, too much of insights. It is not giving us any decision-making insights, uh, right? So as Sahil also mentioned, yeah, if you just go deep in, you will not find too much of depth or too much of difference that it is making. It is still for us to kind of put in our brains and then uh, do it. Uh, we have to still depend on our early hiring, you know, our manual interventions when it, when it comes to doing interviews, selecting the candidate, finding the right skill match. And uh, the point that all of us were discussing here, how we are connecting with the universities to get talent uh, uh, from the start itself is very important. Uh, it is not about getting a day zero slot today. I, I've had experiences in the past. I have tied up with a couple of universities where in the sixth semester during engineering, we give them a curriculum on what we want the students to be trained on. Right. So uh, it's gotten to that now. So I, I don't recollect going for a day zero to the campus or day one to the campus and fight for it in the last couple of years. Rather, in, in the in the sixth semester, uh, there are discussions on, okay, uh, for example, I'll pick one example where we were looking at expanding our, uh, you know, InfoSec team. And we wanted, uh, we had a visibility that we need to get 50 more people in the next two years. So uh, a conscious effort was put in, went to the uh, universities, a couple of them, Give them a curriculum, give them a couple of, uh, you know, uh, subjects to, uh, you know, uh, go through. And we did the assessment from a corporate perspective, right? So it was a part of their fifth curriculum, uh, sixth semester curriculum uh, as, as an additional subject, uh, if they are interested to take that. So that helped us kind of be uh, ahead of the spectrum and not uh, fight for that talent when actually the day was there. We were a little proactive in that approach. So a uh, couple of things that these are the things that we noticed. And uh, uh, one more point that we all were discussing and Sahil brought up as well, and all of you uh, spoke as well was, uh, are we focusing on productivity of people uh, through the number of hours that they put in and are available from morning 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and we see them online? Or is it uh, you're more um, output driven? Uh, let's say if somebody is so smart enough and can do uh, a particular, uh, you know, module in three working days when compared to somebody who would take 30 working days, I would rather put in my bet on the person who can do in three working days, right? So uh, productivity is the key rather than uh, number of hours clocked in. Cool. Fantastic. So we'll get into the next segment. Uh, you know, we'll be talking about remote, hybrid and all of this, right? I mean, um, for large organizations, um, you know, I mean, uh, um, they're no strangers to, you know, hire employees around the world. I mean, distributed workforces, I think, is now becoming really true and common. Um, but, you know, I mean, companies across, uh, you know, industries, both small, large, have now started you know, looking for talent beyond boundaries, right? I mean, when we when you talk about um, of course, when pandemic happened, talent, of course, the war for talent, and that also kind of pushed people to look at talent across borders. Um, and trust me, I mean, Indian companies are leading the pack in, you know, hiring international workforce uh, and uh, work remote, remote workforce. So just want to, you know, understand a little bit uh, from uh, your perspective, uh, you know, are you uh, guys looking at this uh, 
you know, becoming a large, uh, you know, thing within your organizations, and especially, you know, organizations where, um, you know, for example, uh, an Ashok Leland, or even for that matter, uh, Nissan or uh, Hero, where, you know, there's no talent available, right? I mean, in such scenarios or niche talent that you need to hire. Uh, Venkat, I think, has raised his hand. Uh, we'll let, you know, Venkat talk and then we can kind of go around the table. Yeah, Vinesh, thanks for bringing this. This most debated uh, area for last two years post-pandemic, especially in the manufacturing, we are still fingers crossed. We are scratching our heads at this point of time, you know. A uh, number of interviews, be it a leadership portion or any portion across, you know, the end of the interview last, you will be, you know, putting yourself a question fired on you saying that, you know, whether it's a work from home or a hybrid job. So this is a constant question any interviewer will is being faced of late for last, you know, one, one and a half years. Having said that, uh, we have come two, three circles on this. If I say two, three circles on this, you know, uh, being a manufacturing company, you can't sit at home and bring the truck out. So in that context, you know, it was very difficult initially and pandemic uh, uh, thought, taught us in terms of which roles can be work from home, which roles can be permanent. You see, for example, a production shop role, it cannot be work, be work from home. Some of these supporting functions like, you know, a CA department or a design function can be work from home. And again, we implemented this going forward. Some of the roles and some of the function can be work from home and a hybrid work, for example, uh, you know, a person can come once in a week, have a meeting with the work, with the designers, and then go back and do the design work at home. Uh, these kind of things, which we did during the uh, uh, pandemic, and if you ask me, can we sustain this going forward? It was very difficult to sustain because those roles at the pandemic has been put on a, a you know complete uh, in presence role after that because we found the uh, employees often. You know, if a certain uh, in a manufacturing company, if certain roles and certain functions are work from home, it was becoming difficult for us to sustain over a period of time because the rest of the function cannot work in person with the other functions are working from home. So that dichotomy challenging situation, we were not able to handle it. To be honest with you, it's coming from my heart. Mm. Second, uh, work from home or this pandemic has given us a lot of room to create satellite offices. For example, if I say satellite offices, uh, you have designers sitting in Chennai and designing product or designing product manufactured at Pantnagar. So in that context, people from Pantnagar used to come to design office, design here and sit, design here and then go back. So we created satellite offices in Pantnagar, in Pune and in Alvar, saying that you know these are the design satellite offices who will be designing there and supporting the manufacturing there. So a lot of opportunities have opened up during a uh, pandemic and still uh, a long way for a manufacturing company to think about work from home. Uh, still a long way for a manufacturing company to put this in uh, practice. Somewhere it has helped, it, helped us into coming out with some women-centric uh, policies uh, because women go through life stage uh, career changes. So in that context, some women-centric policies were able to put in place based on uh, the uh, based on pandemic outcome, based on work from home. Some of the roles where women can be part of it also have been put in work from home policies and also sub a sabbatical policy for women. So this is on a limited sphere, which we were able to do it in the last uh, you know, two years. All right, uh, Venkat. I mean, um, the question here is, um, you know, we're talking about uh, the global talent hubs and, you know, I mean, our companies looking at, uh, now that it is open, um, boundary, you know, there's no, it's, it's like borderless, right? I mean, talent acquisition. Um, so, Harsha, you want to comment on that? Uh, no, definitely. See, when I, I, I talk to a lot of these companies that bring uh, uh, new companies into India in the form of GCCs, right? Uh, what I hear is at least three new companies every quarter, uh, the answers of the world and uh, many such companies who bring uh, basically multinational companies in retail, healthcare, technology space to India. So, of course, what I see is in, 
in specific technology areas, there is talent density, but you cannot restrict your hiring to a given geography. So okay, I've historically, in my past experience, moved a lot of positions which were difficult to hire in locations like Philippines or South America, where tech talent availability is fairly limited to India. On the other hand, there are some situations where we could not find right, right talent in India. Can we do a bit of a, a, a near shoring and look at other geographies, right? So. I mean, today as we speak, we are looking at Europe and uh, other unconventional countries uh, today where we are trying to hire talent in the near shore locations where our customer has presence, right? Because we provide digital transformation consulting, it is important for us to have presence in the areas where our customers are. Okay, We can take up some work uh, as remote, but not all part of the work, right? Be as near as possible to the customer. We look at opportunities, as, as you rightly said, location agnostic, right? Can, can I put a proposal to give you a, a, a pod which will function out of a, a given geography? As long as I can commit to this, our customers are okay, right? You, if the problem is only when this pod spreads across multiple geographies, coordination, collaboration, time zones become a challenge, right? So the, the, the plan of action is this. How do I make sure that I do a proper assessment of availability of talent given uh, for a given tech space? Identify geographies proactively and say, hey, if you are looking for talent in this geography in this segment, be it OEM, be it healthcare, be it e-commerce, be it BFSI, I can give you a part that will own the entire uh, execution, right? This is a thought process right now, but again, like I said, uh, there's a long way to go, okay? The shift is other way around. People, I mean, companies that have failed to hire in other geographies, especially for digital talent, are coming to India because the talent density is much uh, higher in India. Got it. Got it, Arsha. Uh, Jaljit, you want to Yes. Um, just one point. Uh, so um, now just to give a context to uh, the organization that I work with. So here uh, we are largely vendor driven vendor uh, execute the projects are largely executed by vendors like so our in-house talent is more uh, you know is lean i would say across the globe you know so largely you know most of the vendors do a lot, large part of our work which which is required to be done so but there is a there's a shift in terms of thinking uh, now uh, there is a realization that we need to build inherent inherent knowledge and we also need to do a lot of insourcing, which means we don't uh, reverse the equation from uh, um, large outsourced in a proportion to you know larger insource workforce. So that that is really uh, uh, the focus now and uh, and that is where they are looking at India because India uh, and we being in India uh, they see they see a uh, Possibility that we we should be able to hire people um, in uh, from India and probably you know do a second mint or you know uh, cross border you know movement uh, both ways I would say Japan to India India to Japan uh, we call it talent exchange program which we have embarked on okay um, but some of these models are expensive because these are second mints and then you have to support family you know support school and you know, a lot of that so. These are not, um, you know, very cost effective that way because we have a uh, buy policy. Those are, uh, you know, kind of uh, cost loaded, uh, you know, programs. So the other option is we are looking at is local hires, which means they can hire directly from India. You know? So we can source those people from here and they can uh, hire uh, locally as a local talent, which means they they offer them just like a local job hire in Japan. They would probably you know, offer that. So that is one way. I mean, we have to look at if multiple models just can't be all second mints and uh, foreign service assignments, but it has to be a mix of, uh, you know, local hire plus second mints. So that way uh, we manage the cost or the large budget, uh, you know, constraints that we have, right? So, yeah, that's a big thing to show. Yeah, uh, so just, Abrash, uh, just to add to that, right? Uh, and you and I have had multiple conversations on these, right? So basically, uh, two, three ways to look at it, right? One is, uh, uh, I mean, two, three ways to look at talent beyond boundaries, right? One is things that you do, like, you know, the the return to India or whatever, where, you know, we're getting, like, some experienced people from, like, in the tech space, especially from the Bay Area to India, right? And and a lot of companies have been successfully been doing it. We've done it ourselves, right? Um, the other one is, uh, the other aspect of that is, you know, 
you know, hiring in different countries. Now that is definitely a business ask, right? So for example, folks, uh, uh, we, we are, uh, you know, we now kind of, a uh, Razor Pay is now a live payment gateway in, in Malaysia, right? And we had to hire a few people there. So that's definitely business driven. We try to see here in a few more countries in the Asian continent. Uh, and we are actively hiring and Avinash and folks are also helping us with that. So thank you for that. But uh, there was definitely a time in between where uh, companies, and this was actually also because of, you know, the high wage cost in India, uh, right? When it was the employ, employ uh, the candidates market, right? Um, uh, where a lot of investors and the board meetings were, have, were, were, discussing one of the critical agendas that, you know, should Eastern Europe be one of the areas that we should now think about, right? Uh, do we always need people in the office, right? But unfortunately, that those conversations have gone a little off track uh, because of this recent thing about, hey, let's get, let's come back to work or whatever. But personally for me, um, now I know we are a company that's based out of India and, you know, we have a big tech workforce. Uh, but think about this, that you have, you have, a small team or or like a few team members, for example, in DevOps, who are ensuring that your systems are up and live 99.9% or maybe more than, or let's say 100% for that matter. It's their OKR. Um, they're sitting somewhere in Poland and doing a great job. And all you need to do is you're making sure that they get the right, I mean, you pay them well, uh, you give them the, provide the right benefits. And you ensure that there's a good engagement with your other teams, right? Whether you're sitting in India or you're sitting the other side of the world. Um, and they are not, you know, there should not be this complete disconnect or a vacuum between the two teams. If if any company can ensure that you work like this, uh, you, can, you can run a highly distributed model. And, and like just calling out uh, one company, like I worked for two companies before this, Adobe and Uber. Um, Uber was far more younger than, than Adobe, but the way they were running this huge distributed teams across the world that were actually running similar policies, uh, you know, driver uh, policies, ETA policies, Uber Eats policies and whatever, right? They would have somewhere started with the same thought initially, right? When they were just mailing it. And then they kind of excelled in this. And today they run exceptional global operations. I mean, if you're in Bangalore, you don't get that experience. But if you're somewhere else, if, let's put it this. If you're in any other ready metros, you don't get the real Uber experience. But you step out of the country, um, you get to know what the real Uber experience is. And that's the, one of the reasons they're doing it. So I think it's just some sort of uh, apprehension. Uh, I mean, I personally wouldn't mind a great recruiter working from every, anywhere, um, no, no matter how many hours they work. Like, I, I, I to be honest, right, I, I'm driving the return to office hybrid model for Razorpay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of guilt in that because I personally work remote. <laughs> um, so I work remote and I visit Bangalore and the Delhi offices once a month. So I don't know how, how productivity really is impacted if, wherever you are. Super, super fantastic. I guess we've really run out of time, but uh, one last thing. Um, if you were to, you know, kind of write the playbook uh, for 2024, um, what are the two things that you would like to see on it? Uh, you know, I mean, we'll just go around the table quickly and uh, then close it. Uh, file or oh well. Sure, I think a lot of things have been said. I love the way Kirith went like a marathon uh, uh, with so many ideas. Uh, I do I do hope you make this recording available to us. I think we can do master classes on each of the ideas that Kirith and everybody else has already spoken about. Uh, I think uh, very, very old school. Uh, one of the things that I would love to see on the playbook is walk the talk. Uh, it may not be a theme. It may not be a, a, a hot selling item. But I think uh, the way Kirit spoke about contradictions uh, of uh, working remotely and yet trying to get people back to work. Um, classic scenario, right? Uh, you're talking about a distributed workforce. Uh, you know, friends... Alik Chiaro was talking about the fact that he had an employee who had to go and visit his ailing, ailing parents in the US. And uh, the amount of approvals needed, the amount of time that it took to say, okay, don't worry, we trust you and you will work during India time zone. It was a Herculean task. And then the person gets to the US and sees ads on social media that say we are looking at hiring a distributed workforce. Now, that's the farce 
that I think we really need to get away from, right? Because it, it's gone are the days when you can go out and paint a very different picture for the world because today your employees are watching the same space where you're advertising and they're going to say, hey, you know what? It took me four weeks for a very genuine cause where my parents are undergoing an operation in the US and you didn't let me go. Then you asked me hundreds of questions and here you're saying I'm okay hiring people from the Bay Area and this and that. It sounds very fancy, but it's not true. So I think walking the talk is one thing across everything that we do is what I would love to see on the playbook. Number two, um, doing a deep dive on AI. I think AI is here to stay. But education on AI, to say where should you use AI, where should you not use AI. In using AI, I'll give you a very, very, it's a very funny story. And I know we're running short of time, so I'll keep it down to 30 seconds. But a very funny yet real story. Um, uh, another founder friend of mine, uh, CHRO, working, talking to the CPO, the financial officer, says, hey, you know what, can you sanction this budget? And the guy is saying, brilliant, you know, automate HR, this, that, and the other, but where is AI in this? Because if we take it to the owner and there is no AI, it won't get approved. So you, you just hear it out. The first time I heard it and I was like, bizarre. You know, you have a problem, you have a solution, you have a partner in the market who's giving you a solution for your problem, but because it's not so-called AI, it won't get signed off because there's a budget for AI. And obviously different size of organizations, Avinash, as you very correctly mentioned, work very differently. But I think moving away from the fad of latching onto the bandwagon versus solving problems, genuine problems that can be solved, whether it's automation or AI or ML or you know, blockchain or whatever it may be, don't just latch onto the fad, but latch on to what is going to solve a genuine employee problem, customer problem, colleague problem. So I'll stop there on those two points that I had that I would love to see on the book. Fantastic, Sahil. Awesome. Wengat, uh, oh, Harsha, Harsha. Yeah, so, while I would like to have a lot of other things like Sahil mentioned and uh, Kirit mentioned, right? Uh, AI and other stuff in the playbook. But one thing that, that is close to my heart is diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? So uh, unfortunately, it has become a check in the box, right? While things have changed compared to how uh, inclusion of women in the workforce uh, in the past used to be, uh, we all may probably say that it has it has only become better. But if you look at the global statistics, right? I'll just go to statistics there. The International Labor Organization report last year said, uh, for every educated unemployed men out there, there are still two educated unemployed women out there. Okay, and if you look at the look at India in particular, where we, where we spoke about uh, talent density being so high for uh, tech talent, especially the global average of women participation in work is forty seven percent, and in India it is around twenty four percent. Right, we still have a lot of distance to cover in that space. Right, I think the post pandemic world, the remote ways of working, hybrid ways of working. So while there are well, like Venkat rightly said, you can't uh, manufacture a car sitting at home, manufacture a Ashok Leyland uh, heavy motor vehicle sitting at home, but you can definitely ship good software products sitting at home. You can definitely create best-in-class product solutions for your uh, customers sitting at home, which are basically user experience on an application, on an interface uh, like mobile or web, right? Use it to our advantage and really make it happen uh, for women, right? I'm not saying just to have another check in the box that a percentage of diversity is 50% and we are good, right? Because today you're catering to diversity of customers, your thought process also needs to be diverse. Unless you have more diversity in the back of products and solutions that you're sh shipping, your product is still skewed. Your target audience may be uh, widespread, mm -hmm. but your product is still not catering to widespread audience from its thought process. That's one thing that I would definitely like to see uh, as part of the playbook that collectively TA leaders are going to write for the future. Awesome. Thanks. Um, yes, Venkat. Yeah, see, uh, the kind of things Sahil and uh, Asha, this same playbook, I would like to also pursue in the coming next year or going forward in the future. One is rightly DEI, because uh, as Parley said by Asha, it is not a tick box activity. Somewhere we need to work on this area going forward. We have put a roadmap and strategy uh, for next five years. I hope at least if we can do 20-30% out of it, as a company, Ashok Leland will would have gone a long way in that uh, you know, space. And I also look 
forward to digitization of HR. Uh, maybe I may be at a first step in that, but still that's a huge playbook uh, or a bigger playbook for me in uh, my company going forward in digitization of some of the process. And I think I think digitalization will be here to stay for a longer period of time till every other company evolves to its, uh, you know, evolves to its uh, requirement. So that's what digital HR and DEI. DEI. And personally, as my role here uh, on, the, on the capability building, because the business landscape is changing, the capability of my existing engineers to the level of bringing out uh, newer, newer technology into the organization, the capability building personally will be a bigger playbook for me in 24-25. Kirit so. and then Jaljit. Yeah, so... I mean, in addition to whatever has been added here, uh, one thing I really like to add is uh, like if there's a section on, uh, you know, how to define your goals. Like basically, how do you go back to your basic obsession? Like what are you chasing? What do you want? Right? And that's where it comes. You know, what do you? What does productivity mean? To you? Productivity mean to you? Um, what is it? Right? Um, a lot of plethora of things. Right? Um, I think people do need that understanding that what, what, how to build a vision of what you want to chase out. And second is definitely going to be this, this change in the definition of employer branding, as Sahil said when he had joined the conversation. Uh, it's no more about, you know, two likes, three likes on your LinkedIn post or whatever, but or maybe what's happening on Glassdoor. But um, how do we make it bigger from it? What does it really mean, right? Because your employer branding is not coming from what's on social media. It's actually coming from how what your employees are feeling today. Uh, that's more important. You know, what your candidates are feeling who are now your potential employees. So two cool. things. Yeah, a few points. One on the AI uh, part. I think AI, uh, you know, the HR fraternity, how much are they uh, capable of evaluating these products in the market? And there's a lot of aggressive push happening. Uh, from every startup that is in the market today trying to sell their you know product and uh, are we really able to evaluate it correctly you know matching the need that we have so a little bit of that uh, skilling up uh, we may all need as a as a hr fraternity um, and one could be a fraternity that we community that we build you know where a lot of success stories are shared about the AI experience that or different uh, you know products or vendors they have tried, which has really helped them you know bring results. I think some kind of success story sharing will really help uh, every company take the right decisions you know in terms of investment. Um, number two is on I would I. I'm a very strong advocate of healthy hybrid, which means uh, not an enforced hybrid model, uh, a very healthy kind of a, a visit to office and um, both ways, I think remote as well, where there is enough balance at the same time, enough connect and enough uh, reason to meet and, uh, you know, uh, face to face and all that and all the good things that it brings, uh, you know, uh, by doing that. Um, the other one on the hiring front, I think I still believe that um, uh, trust is a big thing. I think why people join organization is about it's about intimacy and trust. I think uh, we all as talent acquisition uh, teams, we have faced that, you know, why people join us is because how much are we, uh, how much do we connect with them at a very personal level and at their, you know, and uh, with their purpose, uh, you know, or their career purpose at that point in time where that it made a lot of make, make make sense for them to join us so yeah a lot more of that intimacy a customer i mean the kind of candidate intimacy i would say is important for hiring um young talent uh, obviously the interns and the conversion to freshers and all of that that's a one good pool we should always leverage i think uh, that has a lot of value from a cost and from a uh, curiosity and the, for a, from a productivity standpoint, you'll see that's a good uh, pool to really uh, leverage all the time. Um, yeah, and as some of us mentioned, you know, second career for women, I think we all talk about it, but we're not really leveraged it completely. Uh, can we look at programs which will help, uh, you know, help them seamlessly move into, uh, you know, mainstream, uh, you know, work? So, 
some of it we have we still not there i think that is one area where as uh, hr fraternity we need to put our heads together and think and come up with those problems thank, thank you thank you marisha jaldeep so uh, so what we are hearing of course is uh, very similar to you know the trends that we saw over the last year, couple of years i think they will continue to be there and then how it's it's very fluid at this point in time and how we as a fraternity kind of come together and ensure you know that uh, we are uh, you know kind of able to um, you know extract gather more uh, out of you know some of these uh, points that were discussed in terms of ai and you know i mean the whole lot of other uh, things that you want to see on the playbook right i mean of course the global situation will remain challenging um but as we look forward uh, you know we find hope innovation collective determination to build a stronger more inclusive resilient workforce for the future and i think all of us together here will be able to kind of uh, do that uh, thank you indeed very much for joining i hope uh, you guys have taken some uh, bit of uh, experience that was shared across the you know table uh, we will come back to you with more such sessions um, uh, this a copy of this recording will be shared with you at end of day and also um, you know there is a group known as leaders exchange um, uh, a link of that has been shared on the chat here uh, so please uh, join and uh, keep contributing to that group keep uh, adding your perspectives there so that the uh, fraternity kind of gets to learn uh, from your experiences and uh, looking forward to seeing you again uh, in in the, in our next conversations thank you so much indeed for being here this morning